Hello, I'm Jennifer McClendon, SFMA's Education Manager. Thank you for joining us today for our educational webinar series to highlight the educational offerings that will be presented at the 2025 conference in Palm Springs, California, January 13th through the 16th. Today, our speaker is Paul Cushing. Paul is a 34-year veteran in the sports field and golf course industries. Paul started in the sports field industry when he was 13 years old, where he attended his first STMA conference in Phoenix, Arizona. While attending the conference, Paul was able to sit at the head conference speaker table with STMA pioneers, Dr. Kent Kurtz, Harry Gill, Dr. Bill Daniels, and Joe Torre. After that incredible experience, he was hooked to the turf business for life. In high school, Paul worked on the field crew at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, as well as working part-time at the STMA National Office located in Upland, California. Paul has a degree from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, BS in ornamental horticulture with an emphasis in turfgrass management and soil science. In 2016, after a successful 27-year career in the golf business, Paul started his own consulting business with Paul Cushing Sports Turf Agronomic Consulting Services. Paul works with numerous professional, university, college, high school, and youth fields all throughout the state of California. He has a distinct ability to bring professional type playing conditions to every level of sports fields with common sense agronomic solutions that rejuvenate fields and work at all levels of management or budget structure. Today, Paul will be presenting Rejuvenating Your High School Sports Fields. Paul? Thank you, Jennifer, for having me. This is, um, good morning, everyone. Um, this is a real thrill for me to be here. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, um, uh, I started doing this when I was about 10 years old and uh, started working on my Little League baseball fields with my dad and uh, and it was kind of carried on. I, uh, by the time I was 13, I pretty much knew what I wanted to do. And, um, and so anyways, really excited. I used to take care of my high school baseball field uh, when I was playing baseball. And uh, so this is, a, this is a lifelong love for me. And it's, it's fun to be able to talk with you guys about uh, our high school fields today. So let's uh, move forward. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, um, I started working at the Rose Bowl in high school. I started when I was 14 years old at the Rose Bowl. Um, that's me on the left there in the uh, USC sweatshirt. I'm sorry for the USC sweatshirt, but uh, I think, I'm sure pretty much somebody gave it to me for free. Um, but anyways, that's uh, I had painted the rose there in the middle. And so we took a picture. That's my dad next to me. Um, on the far right is Dr. Kent Kurtz, um, somebody that was a huge mentor to me in the business. And, and Dr. Kurtz started with me when I was very young. And um, he's the reason why I, I love being involved in sports fields and being in this business. And so um, thank you to Dr. Kurtz. Uh, but uh, anyways, as I um, started in the business, I worked on sports fields, got to college, um, and then a uh, little bit like Gilligan's Island, I took a three hour tour and uh, went away for 27 years. So I, uh, the allure of free golf and, and uh, $3 more an hour was too much. And I went to the golf business. Um, these are some of the golf courses that I managed while I was a superintendent. Uh, I started at Riviera Country Club when I was 21. And uh, by the time I was 24, I was the superintendent. And so some really neat golf courses, uh, Shadow Creek, is in Las Vegas, uh, Edgewood up in Lake Tahoe, and then finally finished up uh, my career as a superintendent to, at Torrey Pines in San Diego. So anyways, I bring a, a really different perspective to this uh, from a soil standpoint and an agronomic standpoint. And, uh, and, and I think the final thing that, that's unique about me is I was a high school baseball coach and owned a travel baseball club down in San Diego. And so this is really why I work um, so diligently with high school sports fields is seeing what the local high schools were like and the, and the poor conditions on fields. Um, and as a high school coach and somebody, you know, that, that knows how to grow grass, this is when I started my business, um, I really wanted to get in and make a difference in our youth fields in the area. And so this is um, kind of a fun thing that, that kind of got me into the business. And so or that got me into when I started my own business with consulting, I really got in uh, with high schools and working with their sports fields and improving conditions for our, for our youth. And so uh, anyways, and then with my own company, um, I do soil and water testing, uh, independent fertility uh, analysis. I do day visits to schools. 
uh, put together agronomic programs, help them with their sports fields, um, and then uh, do spraying surface services as well. So, okay, let's get into the, uh, so what I want to do with this is just give you guys a sneak preview, a little bit of what uh, you're going to find with this session in January. So we're going to be doing this on January 13th. Um, I want to just give you a little sneak preview as to, as to how it's going to be. And then obviously we're going to get into more depth when we have more time. Um, but I just, here are some of the goals of kind of what our session will be. Um, and we're going to look at improving our turf, turf grass health um, through solder, soil and water testing. I think this is really important with high school fields is that we don't do a whole lot of soil testing to understand what's going on down below. And so um, really important, you know, if you're in a place where, where water quality is poor, testing water, understanding how you're getting to where you are um, is, is an important aspect to this. And then soil testing, understanding how to change our soil chemistry down below is a big thing. Uh, you know, the second point, being able to better utilize the nutrients that you already have in the soil, as well as, as additives to make uh, your sports fields better. So we'll talk a little bit about soil chemistry. Um, and I think it's a really important aspect of, of having good fields. So we'll talk about weed control, uh, animal abatement, uh, proper height of cut on our fields. Um, so important as I go around, you know, I see such a varying degree of, of heights of cut. I mean, you have some sports fields that are mowed at four or five inches and, you know, some that are mowed really low. And um, so we'll talk about what that proper height of cut is um, as we get there. Um, renovation practices, aerification, uh, verticutting, top dressing, all those sort of things we'll touch upon. And then uh, the last thing is seasonal scheduling. And it, it's not a one size fits all thing uh, throughout the United States is, you know, during different times of the year, we're doing different things. And so we'll talk about spring, summer, fall type management programs uh, to help you guys with your fields. So um, let's just touch upon as we go, let's, we'll talk about a few things that we're gonna go through. Soil testing and the importance of regular soil testing. Um, I recommend that you soil test at least two times a year. Early in the spring is a great time to see kind of what your, how you've come out of winter and the additives that you'll need to do in the springtime to help your, your grass as it starts to come out of dormancy, as, as it starts to warm up and, and your grass starts to come out of being frozen. This is, this is a great thing to understand what's going on down below. And then secondly, as I mentioned, we like to soil test in the fall so that we have that ability during the wintertime uh, when we do get some rains and we do get some weather where we can leach salts and, and make some, some changes with our chemistry. So soil testing is a really important aspect to having a really strong and good sports field. A um, little bit, and I'm not going to go into this too much. We'll go more into this in the session, but this is uh, this is a worksheet that I go through with clients, uh, and this is a high school Whittier Christian down in the Los Angeles area. Um, you know, some things, this is what I'll do is we'll go through, you know, talk about our cation exchange, our organic matter is a really important part of it, uh, you know, understanding phosphorus and for us here in Southern California and the California region, we really struggle with salts. And so understanding sodium management and how that plays a part in, uh, you know, tying up our soils and, and the complexity of what goes on down below. Calcium to magnesium ratio is that ability for that water to be able to infiltrate into the soil and then be able to release and percolate through the profile. Uh, so that's really important. Potassium to sodium ratio is, um, is the turgidity of the plant. It's the ability when that plant goes down, when it's stepped on, is it able to bounce back up again? And so these are all things that, that we'll be talking about uh, as we get into the session. So, and here's an example, a picture on the left. This is when I started at Whittier Christian. Uh, this was what their fertility programs looked like. And you can kind of see the, the turf a little bit on the, the yellow side. And um, a few months later, this is what it looked like once we got our fertility programs right. So the, we're going to see a lot of before and after pictures in this. So you guys will kind of get the gist of what we're talking about. Weed control. Weed control is huge, you know, and I, 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 I liken this as to a low hanging fruit uh, when we manage our sports fields is, you know, weeds are one of those things that's a, it's an easy thing to eliminate. 
you know, and then here's a, here's a baseball field. That's probably about 90, 95% clover, as you can see. And, um, you know, this, this field had beautiful turf underneath, but it was just clover covered in clover. Um, and so real easy, come in spray this, clean this up. And you're going to see some before and after pictures on this field here in a little bit, but, um, weed control is a, it's an important part of having a great field, you know, getting the weeds out of there. Um, animal abatement. Um, this is everyone's favorite uh, movie, I'm sure. Uh, Caddyshack. As a as a golf course superintendent, this was uh, uh, this was always a fun fun movie for me. But uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk about gophers a little bit. We'll talk about animals and um, controlling them. We'll talk about some physical control uh, as well as you know using some of the um, the smoke units and some of those that are popular with high schools now. So we'll talk. Uh, we'll definitely hit on this. Uh, airification is a huge, huge part of, of success with sports fields. Um, and it doesn't matter what level you're at, all the way from, from Little League all the way up to professional is, is the ability to be able to poke holes and, and vent and let our, you know, let our fields that are hard work, to, you know, give them a chance to, to open up and breathe a little bit. Um, we'll talk about some strategies on, you know, during the middle of the season, being able to come in. Picture to the left is core airification. We'd like to do that once or twice a year. But the thing that I really like in the center here is, is solid time airification. Uh, this is something that you can do a lot. The players don't even know that you've done this. Uh, and it's just a great way to, to, to vent that upper profile and kind of release some of that, that gas and, and get some oxygen to move. And so um, really good. And then deep time airification, which is on the right, uh, you know, getting down eight to 10 inches, really getting down low and opening soils up. So airification uh, will be a, a big topic of discussion. Um, proper height to kind of hit upon this before, you know, picture to the left is a, a high school baseball field. Uh, you know, this is a really good proper cut for the infield. The picture to the right, unfortunately, is what I see a lot of um, in my visits to high schools and, and the schools, you know, that I start working with. You see this, you know, fields being mowed at three, four inches, leaving the clippings on top. Um, you know, just um, the importance of getting in there and, and mowing consistently, you know, to be able to manage clippings, you know, cleaning clippings off, um, you know, those, those are all things that we'll discuss. So proper height of cut. So, okay, last part of this, we're going to get in. Uh, let's talk about some before and after stuff. So this is, um, this is a high school down in the Orange County region of, of Southern California. This is uh, Santa Margarita Catholic High School. This is when we started with this field a couple of years ago. This is what this field looked like. Uh, this was in July. So you can see very sparse growth. Um, a lot of us, this is, we see our fields during the off season. This is obviously after baseball season ended. Um, you know, we start to see things decline. And so these guys and looking at, we did some soil testing on these fields. Uh, we had some sodium issues. Um, plant was taking on three times more sodium than it was potassium, which is not good. Um, we had the ryegrass die out. We had some irrigation issues on this field, um, had compaction, uh, you name it, uh, it, was, it was going on. So came in, did some soil testing, understood, got some applications down, did some verification. You can see a little bit of a sprinkler on the picture on the left. Uh, this is called a micrometer. Um, and we use this for leaching salts out. We're able to get some gypsum down on the field and then we're able to leach uh, the salts through the profile with these micrometers. This is what the field looked like a couple months later. So this was, uh, first picture was July. This was in uh, November. Um, and you can see a huge difference. We had done a ryegrass overseed on this field uh, to try and get some surface back in. Um, so obviously you can see this is uh, ryegrass coverage, but you can see just the difference in the color of the turf, um, you know, getting the salts out of there, um, getting the right, the right nutrients in, you know, we were able to change this field profoundly. So this past year, um, we came in and we did a, a really cool thing with this field. Uh, as we came in, we turf plane this infield out. So the unit to the left is uh, called a turf planer. And I love this unit in that uh, we can come in, we can take this field out and we can get it perfectly level. So you see the picture to the right is after that turf planer gets done, this field is com 
completely level um, at the grade that we want it at. We're able to come in, make some tweaks. You know, we'll come in and and do a little bit of work on some low areas and some high areas and things. But basically, this field is ready to go uh, for sod. So we came in, we turf planed this field, um, removed all the material, did some slight grading, did some fertilization, and voila, we were able to sod this field um, within. I think we sodded within five days after turf planting it. This is um, Tahoma uh, Hyper Bermuda on the left. So that's what the field looked like on the left right after we sodded it. This is what the field looked like about two weeks ago. So this picture is uh, about two weeks old or about two weeks past. So this sod has been in for about two, almost three months now. So um, so this is what we're starting to do with our fields is we're getting away from overseeding, you know, getting into uh, being sustainable year round with Bermuda grass. Uh, we will go slightly dormant here in, in Southern California in the wintertime, but it greens right back up again once you start to get to February. It's starting to green right back up and, and, and ready for the playing season. So here's another example of a field. This is down in San Diego. This is San Marcos High School. Uh, this infield had some serious salt issues. Um, they were about five to one sodium to potassium. This plant was taking on a lot of salt and uh, you can see the thinness of it. Um, so this picture again, this was about July, August uh, that we, were, we took this picture and then uh, we were able to, to do some verification, make some changes, some modifications to the soil profile. We did some pretty serious leaching on this field and this is what the field looked like uh, for the start of the season. So the picture to the left is we had overseeded this infield to get it back, but the picture to the right, um, we have um, in the last year turf planed this field and changed out to Hyper Bermuda, and now we're leaving this alone. So we're not overseeding anymore. So the picture to the right is the new Hyper Bermuda surface. This is Latitude uh, Hyper Bermuda, which is a, a terrific grass as well. So. Um, I think this is my last one here. This is uh, Mission Hills High School. So you saw the, this picture to the right with the weeds. Uh, this was the high school. This is what the field looked like. Um, this was actually after the pandemic, you know, and this was, you know, we had stopped maintaining our fields for four or five months during the pandemic and kind of let them get crazy. And so picture to the left, just a lot of Johnson grass, um, you know, a lot of weeds, just crazy picture in the center. This is this outfield was literally 90, 95% clover. It was crazy. So these pictures were taken in the, um, this was taken about August, September. Um, this is what the field looked like in January. So we we're able to get all the weeds out, get the height of cut back down, um, you know, get, get everything cleaned up. Same thing with the outfield. There was no overseeding on this. This had a tall fescue outfield. So we just got the weeds cleaned up. And um, so this is the kind of stuff when we get into our session, we'll talk about how to do things, you know, the, the steps in, in getting from, from A to Z and uh, helping you guys improve your fields. So um Last thing, uh, these are some some pointers for the fall for you guys. Is if, you, if you're getting, you know, if you're in the west coast or southeast, you know, where you're still going to be growing grass uh, uh, in the south, um, you know, I, I think the important part that I like to talk about with our high school fields is the use of products like methylene urea, using slow release products, um, you know, getting away from using the quick release products, you know, and I. <clears throat> excuse me um i like in the quick release products like drinking a red bull or a monster you know it's quick in quick out you know four hours later you're you're crashing um getting away from using you know your ammoniacals and your ureas as your as your fertility program and get into using those those long lasting materials that are going to hang in for you know 12 to 16 weeks i love methylene urea you get about 16 weeks worth of growth out of it uh with with an application and so using that as our baseline so that we're not riding a roller coaster with our fertility program so use of slow release fertilizers are really important um, on your sports fields for being successful aerifying um poking holes you know doing a core aerification at least 
one time a year and then solid time applications as much as you possibly can. So um, we'll hit upon that a bunch. Um, warm season grasses, making sure that we're verticutting, we're tickling them uh, continuously through the summer, lot, not letting them get thatchy and puffy on us, um, you know, making sure that we keep young juvenile growth through the growing season. So um, that's an important part light sand top dressing. Uh, and I think this is this is one of the things that we miss on a lot of our, our sports fields, uh, particularly at the high school level, is the ability to be able to lightly top dress during the growing season. Um, and whether you're able to use a spinning top dresser or a drop uh, top dresser, you know, anything, even uh, using a, a rotary fertilizer spreader and kind of opening the holes and allowing to, to get light sand out, really an important part of, of being a successful uh, turf grass management. So sand top dressing, um, really a, an important part of the process. And then finally, um, if you guys haven't already, is getting your pre-emergent uh, herbicide applications down for our winter grassy weeds. Um, you know, this is the time of the year, end of October, start of November is a great time to get your pre-emergents out for, for the uh, fall and the winter season. And then in, in California here, we talk, you know, January-ish, February-ish in different parts of the country, probably a little bit later as, as snow melts and those sort of things, but making sure you're utilizing pre-emergent applications to help keep some of those grassy weeds like poanya and some of our broadleaf weeds down. So um, anyways, I think that's it. Uh, we will see you guys in Palm Springs on uh, January 13th. That's when this session will will take place. And uh, here is my contact information. If any of this stuff was intriguing to you, or if you have any questions and you can't wait till you get to January, I know I know you're excited. Please feel free to, uh, to reach out and um, I'll help out any way I can. Also my website down below as well, if, um, if you wanna look a little bit more and research a little bit more on this. So Jennifer, thank you for having me. Thanks, Paul. I know everybody's really excited and looking forward to this presentation in Palm Springs. Um, we do have some time for Q&A, and it looks like we already have a question in the chat. Um, Paul, are you able to access the chat, or would you like me to read that out loud? Yeah, can you read it? Uh, uh, if you could, Jennifer, that'd be great. Sure. Cynthia is asking, can you talk about the feasibility of natural grass on high school stadium fields where year-round heavy use is the expectation? Yeah, and that's... Um, there are going to be, you know, and I may discuss this, um, there are some hybrid systems, you know, I, I'm doing some work with FIFA right now, and, and we're preparing for the World Cup in 2026, which we'll talk more about as well. Um, but the use of hybrid systems, you know, of half grass, half uh, artificial turf, uh, there's some really interesting things for high school fields. Um, in terms of just maintaining natural grass, um, you know, it's really important to, you You have to have a great fertility program in place. Um, you've got to, you, you must airify during the course. If you have a lot of heavy use, the, the use of a solid time air fire is a huge uh, weapon in in your side to, to being able to keep a field playable year round, you know, and, and this is what we see with our high school fields, you know, we use them and, and that's, hey, this is a part of the, the whole equation, we want them to be used, but the ability to be able to vent them and be able to open them up and let them breathe, you know, and, and just an example, you know, we do high school games, if we do a high school baseball game or a football game on a Friday, and we know the field's not going to be used until Monday of the next week for practice, is we'll airify that field right after after the game on a Friday or do it on Saturday morning to be able to allow it to breathe for the whole weekend, you know, just to stay open and, and let it, let it breathe. So solid time airification would be a, a huge component for you to, to keep a field playable year round along with a good fertility program and um, some other things. So hopefully that helps um, hit me up. If, um, if, if you need some more information on that, happy to, to help you out. Cynthia, I had a follow-up question. Um, can you talk about organic matter and your experiences amending sports fields with compost? Yeah, um, compost is a good thing um, in small amounts. And I would not talk about burying our fields with compost. Um, we do a lot of this. We do, I, I, I do this a lot. And as we overseed, we'll use a light layer of compost to be able to help 
cover the seed light amounts of compost with a with a spinning top dresser or something where you can put a, a film out is a great thing organic matter is a huge driver in our soils you know the the ability the microbial activity the the ability to be able to get those microorganisms in the in the soil working is a is a huge thing but you have to be careful a, a little bit is is good a lot is not a great thing because what happens is we'll see our fields sealed off when we do a lot of organic matter and that organic just tends to to seal like a you know kind of like a wet paper almost where it gets real grimy and it doesn't allow for air to be able to move into the soil and it doesn't allow it to be able to to release so light amounts are good i would not say you know heavy heavy top dressing um on a year round basis is probably not a great thing because you're going to build that organic right up in that upper profile and, and then other things are going to start to happen. So it's like everything, I guess uh, a little bit is good. Probably too much is not great on a field. Um, which public K through 12 schools have you had as clients for soccer or football fields? Um, I've done, I do about 10 to 12 high school um, sports. And what I do is I work with districts. So I'll work with a district. Very rarely will I work with an individual school. I work with a few individual schools on, on just individual fields. Uh, but most of my work is through school districts. So school districts, uh, Northern California, uh, Central California, Southern California. I'm kind of all over the state of California. So I, I see it all. And so... Um, I do work with a lot of school districts. Um, next question. Uh, is it mostly baseball? No, no. Football, soccer, um, baseball a little bit. I'm just using some baseball pictures on here, but no, it's everything. Multi-purpose fields. So yeah, when I come into a school, we're doing, we're doing all the fields, we're doing soil testing. So we'll come into a school, we'll soil test each of the fields, and then we'll start off and, and set up individual programs for each field so that, uh, you know, because all fields, they're like kids, they're all different. They all have different, you know, needs and, and, um, you know, they're not all the same. So, uh, yeah, we prescribe programs. I help you prescribe programs to where it's real easy for you to follow and, and, and help get your fields back up and running. So very simple. Cynthia says, thank you. Great presentation. Awesome. Um, this is, uh, this is just a little teaser. The, uh, when we get together, I'm going to be, we'll, we'll have some energy drinks. We'll have some sunflower seeds and some bananas and some candy. It'll, uh, it'll be a fun session. I like to, I, I like to keep it loose and, um, we'll have some fun with this. So looking forward to seeing you guys in January. Okay. Any other questions? And just put them right there in the chat. We have another one. <clears throat> what would be the best thing I can do to get and keep my fields play ready as play ready as possible if I don't have a crew and I oversee six varsity fields? As a as a high school coach, I would tell you empowering your high school programs to help you out. You know, this is uh, it has to be a partnership. You're um, you can't do it all by yourself. That's a lot to, to cover. And so empowering and working with your coaching staffs, they really want their fields to be good. You know, and I, as I do this, you know, I talk to our coaches and say, Hey, if, if this is going to be successful, you're going to have to play a part in it because each team's got 20 kids on them, 20 plus kids, you know, use those kids to help you. And, um, you know, every situation I get into, we have work, days where we where we bring the kids and the students to to help maintain the fields the coaches you know playing a part of this so I would really empower you to get your get your coaches involved 
get your students involved. Um, what the coaches will do is they'll set up a work list for each of the players on a daily basis. You know, you're responsible for the pitching mound. You're responsible for home plate. You're responsible for, for cleaning the, the turf that's off of the infield, you know, just different, different things like that. But get your, get your students involved. They, the kids love it. The kids really take ownership in their fields and, uh, and it helps you because one person cannot do this job. Um, next question, which, what percentage of the fields are utilizing the hybrid system? Good question. This is, this is, this is something that's coming down the line. Um, the, we'll see this in the World Cup in 2026. Um, all of the fields will all be hybrid based fields. So there'll be a mixture of, of natural grass and synthetic, which will be really cool. Um, I would encourage you to, to start paying attention to what's going on with the World Cup and what FIFA is doing, the research that Michigan State and Tennessee are doing with this, um, this hybrid system is really cool. And I think you're gonna see a lot of NFL stadiums switching over to this. And once the NFL stadiums switch over to this, then you know, I think it's you're gonna see some of the major college programs doing this. And then I think it'll it'll work its way down to the to the high school level. But I really think this is something that's gonna a wave of the future. So as of right now, there are very few, you know, high school fields, you know, for soccer goal mouse. Um, will stitch the goal mouse so that the goal mouse can can wear a little bit better. Um, the center of a, of a football field would be a, a good place to stitch the hybrid in. Um, and I, I tell you what, we will talk about this in in January. Um, I will I will have a, a couple of slides where we can talk about this and touch upon it more. And I'd encourage you to reach out to me personally um, with my contact information. If you want to learn more about this and you're excited about it, I can get you some information right now on it. Okay, next question. How often do you recommend fertilization and what types? Yeah, like I talked about, you know, having a baseline of methylene urea is a, is a really important part of your pro of your of your process. Um, you know, I'd like to see at least three to four times a year with an application of one pound of N with methylene urea. And when you say one pound of N, you know, the connotation is, oh, that's a lot of fertilizer. Um, remember that 80, 90 percent of that is slow release. So you'll get a little quick shot out of it after you put it down, but a majority of it's gonna last you between 12 and 16 weeks. So um, four times, three to four times a year with methylene urea. If you have a big tournament coming up or you have a you know an important game coming up or a stretch where the field's gonna be used a lot, it's okay to put some some products down, you know, a, a turf supreme or a triple 15 or something along those lines. But don't let that be your baseline for your fertility program, because again, that's, um, you know, you put that down and a week later it's gone, you know, and that's not, it's not great because you get a spike in growth with the grass, but also, you know, it's, it's, it's just not good for maintaining good sports field. So um, be consistent with the slow release and then kind of, kind of um, add as, as needed as you go from there, I guess would be my recommendation. Okay, next question. Any schools using robotic mowers or line painters and finding that it makes a big difference? Yes, and it's it's all over the place. Um, this has become very popular and I see, I'd probably say 75% of the school districts that I work with, they have this. And so um, I think it's a great tool. It's, um, you know, it's been a, it's been a huge addition and, and gosh, the lines are straight all the time, which is a really cool thing too. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm a big proponent of it. I think it's a, it's a great addition to what we're doing. Okay. Um, Brett Barker says, thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you guys. These are great questions. Uh, and um, bring your questions. Hopefully you guys are coming in, uh, in January, but um, please feel free to reach out to me. If you've got any other questions, you want to text me. Um, I'm, I'm the kind of guy you text me, you're going to hear back from me. All right. Let's check the chat one more time. Um, he's asking, do, you, uh, do they use robotic mowers too? This is something that's coming down the line. Uh, so we just had our very first PGA Tour event. A couple of weeks ago in Utah, they had a PGA Tour event that only used robotics for mowing field uh, for mowing fairways at night. Um, I definitely see this as a wave coming. 
Um, it is it is something that you know I I would tell you to to research it and make sure you bring it out. You know, test it before going and buying something like these. These are going to be really expensive off the bat, but I think um, they show some really really cool promise um, in terms of where you're going to be able to mow more periodically with them. Um, I think they're going to be consistent. Um, so I, I like it, you know, you can do a lot of the work at night so that when you come in in the morning, it's already done. Um, yeah, I, I think that this is a, a, a thing of the future and, and make sure you're paying attention to this. So, um, if you don't know, or if you haven't heard about the PGA tour event that just did this a couple of weeks ago with the robotics, uh, I would look into that. There's some really cool videos and some stuff, uh, um, and that was a, that was a big scale event where that happened. So that was a pretty cool thing. Okay. And we have one last question. How do you recommend lowering sodium levels? Making sure the very first step of this is, is poking holes. You want to reduce that surface tension. So making sure that, you know, we talked, we talked a lot about solid time airifying this morning, getting a solid time airification in just to break that surface tension up and then using products like gypsum, you know, making sure you're using a good dihydrate gypsum um, and um, or high cal lime. And we'll talk about when we get into the uh, session in January, the difference between high cal lime and gypsum and where what you use when and in what scenario, but getting some gypsum, getting some calcium. And what happens is after you put that gypsum or that high cal lime down is that calcium will attach onto that sodium ion and then getting that water down, getting a good flushing water, whether it be with your irrigation system or doing this right prior to a rainfall, um, either of those things are great. You've got to have some good water and able to, to be able to move that sodium through the profile. So airification, gypsum, and leaching. It's a really big proponent uh, in, in getting rid of salts. Awesome. Lots of great information. We're definitely looking forward to this in Palm Springs. Um, so Paul's presentation will be part of our pre-conference education session, which is going to take place on Monday, the 13th beginning at 1.15 p.m. and running through five o'clock. Um, thank you, Paul. We sure appreciate you presenting and giving us a little taste of what's to come. And um, Paul's information is there on the screen if anyone has any follow-up questions. And we appreciate your attendance today. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. And uh, thanks to everybody for, for great questions, awesome questions, and looking forward to seeing you all in, uh, in Palm Springs. Thanks again. Thank you, guys.